Since the turn of the new millennium, everyone knew that the future of the public sector would include a reliance on emerging digital technologies. Since then, there's been rapid growth, and few of us could imagine a world without digital transformation. You need only look into your pocket to see a computer at your side day in, day out. But while digital transformation is making waves in the private sector and new technology such as VR thrilling the masses, the public sector is only now making the definitive steps towards this digital world. So how do they compare and what challenges do they face? It's no secret that the public sector has in the past been slow to adopt change. The need to minimise risk and place limits on their economic expenses has been at the heart of this issue, but there is no denying the opportunities that lie ahead. For more insight into this, our team paid a visit to Basildon Council in collaboration with Public Eye on the issues within the public sector, such as updating legacy systems, tackling the skills gap in the IT landscape, and how local government are using digital solutions to improve the quality of their services. I'd say the public sector is slower to, to adapt to digital transformation, but not for the want of, of trying. We want to do this. We want to um, be able to engage with residents in a different way, to deliver services in a different way. But we have to ensure that the solutions are affordable uh, and that they are solutions that uh, carry minimal risk. And that's something that in the public sector we have to take much more uh, credence of than perhaps the private sector do as well. There's an opportunity for the public sector to really lead the way when it comes to digital transformation and arguably they're already doing so. Since 2010 the agenda within government has been very much about introducing new working methods to bring about digital transformation and that is very applicable to the commercial sector and in actual fact I've taken some of the writings and the learnings from government digital services and translated that into a white paper for the commercial sector and it's landed very well within the commercial sector. Some of the techniques that have been used in public sector nowadays are very applicable to the private sector. Before 2010 you would never have had anybody advocating the approach in public sector for commercial sector purposes. So there's been a real sea change. I think what we need to do now is educate more of the private sector about those benefits and perhaps dispel some of the myths about what IT in the public sector is all about because it is actually at the leading edge. The, the biggest challenges that we see for local authorities to some extent is, uh, it's really twofold. One is cultural change. Um, you know, to, to be a more, I mean a lot of councils are viewed as being a more traditional based council, traditional type approach, you know, and, and if you think about that, with respect to them, they've got a, a, a quite a large age range and, and experience with, within those spaces and places as well, not just the decision makers but workforce as well. So if you're saying, well, now I've got to save a, a load of money because I'm not going to get it, you know, you've got to pro adapt yourself and in some instances that's led a lot of councils and, and, and I see a lot more going this way as well to adopting things like hot desking. So that's, you know, selling off buildings, trying to be then create sustainable businesses. Well. That's a huge cultural change in itself. Legacy infrastructure is a persistent problem across the public sector at the moment. Um, we've faced this on virtually every um, project that we work on. Now, it's an incredibly difficult thing for the organisations. They've spent decades building up their IT infrastructure, their architectures, and now have to decide which bits to keep, which bits to remove. There is no one size fits all to providing a solution to these? Um, I think the public sector's adoption of change is very, very mixed actually. I, I don't think that they're necessarily slow. I think there will always be situations where you could pull that out uh, and say, well, actually this authority is not doing X and I want my my authority to be able to communicate, I want to be able to tweet them back when I hear a councillor say something live and yet I can't do that, you know, so, um, but I do think that they've got a lot of catching up to do. I would say the biggest challenges in the public and private sector today actually are trying to do more with less, um, trying to do things more quickly, the constant speeding up of development cycles and pressures of getting through things, the constant change of things. Um, and also the, the changing relationships, there's much more 
um, subcontracting and partnership and working in more complex sort of team environments. All of these sort of things are affecting both the public and the private sector. Um, we find that people uh, find a strong process to be very important in addressing these sorts of issues, helping bind teams together nice and quickly and making sure people are on track with the things they're supposed to be doing. It aids better decision making as well, so you can make corrections, stop things that are not working well, um, uh, which is very beneficial in that sort of process. Um, in particular, uh, there is an issue with the, the working of more complex teams. So you find people coming together with different languages, different skill bases, um, and uh, different understandings of what's required and what's expected in terms of delivery. And so having something that binds that all together works really well um, and means that you can get off, you can get through that sort of storming and into the norming phase of delivering your project working environments. The public sector compared to the, the private sector is uh, and can be uh, different to its approaches. Having said that, I'd balance that because um, from my experience, I've seen some councils that have been very, very forward thinking, way ahead of some corporates. You know, Derby City Council was a very good example of that when they did their town hall refurbishment probably now five years ago. I think for local authorities that we see, budgets are there and are being cut. They, they can't really afford to often take a risk on something, just say, well, let's go and spend some money on that and see how it comes out. Um, they're, they're, they're not one of those type of uh, um, organisations. And I think also the value for money thing is a big, big play for them. Now, I think when austerity came in, they'd, they'd already made lots of leaps and bounds forward by going more value for money. When austerity cut in, you know, it was back to let's, let's try and see if we can buy cheaper again because it, you know, you know, it seems to be the safer mechanism. Fortunately now, that's shifting back up to value for money again, and, and uh, that's, that's a huge challenge for them. And with due respect, sometimes they're buying things that they don't necessarily have the skill sets in-house uh, to faci facilitate. So, um, which is why we, again, morph ourselves really into that, that AV department, virtual AV department for local. The background to the, the PMO at Optive was we've been in place for a number of years, and there were a number of steps that we had to take to really establish ourselves. So. I think the first thing really was about establishing project management and the processes and the templates that we used. Once we had that platform, we were able to, to look at how we resourced the PMO. That allowed me to bring in more people, so we brought in some, some truly project skilled people who were able to take some of the burden away from the organisation and share the roles within projects. So my team started to bring in more Prince2 project management skills. Um, we then also expanded the team further, introducing a business relationship manager role. This again further enhanced the skill that we, we had within the team and allowed us to have people who focused on building business cases and benefit realisation. I think once we had all of those things in place, um, it meant that we had a good solid platform to build on and the next step for me was about bringing in a piece of software. Okay, so the sort of things that I see um, the, the PMO being a success is, is seeing the difference that the PMO can make. Um, you know, the team now um, are able to take the seed of an idea and turn that into a business case, pass that through our governance structure, and then take that idea, form a project by designing and developing what it's going to deliver, playing a significant role in that delivery. Um, and then when we've delivered the, the, the change or the new system, whatever it may be, uh, making sure that we learn the lessons from those projects, wrap everything up, tie all the loose ends up so we have a very neat completed project and then also taking the time to really look at the difference that that change has made, so working with our colleagues across the organisation to see the benefits actually be realised and, and be able to complete that loop so we're able to go back through that governance structure and say we came to you with this idea, we delivered the project and look, this is the positive impact it's making for Optimo. A turning point in the development of digital transformation is the advent of streaming services. The ability to connect with the public in a more intimate way brings immediacy to both parties. Any issues that arise can be targeted quickly, conveniently and ultimately minimise cost. Well, I think one of the things with our streaming service that we now know that we want to move on to is to add digital voting, interactive voting. Uh, one of the great things about the webcasting is that it has allowed people to um, understand some of the, the arguments. And let's be honest, 60p in every pound has been cut from our budget. Councils have had to make some very, very difficult decisions. No one comes into this and to be a councillor because you want to cut services for local people. 
but if we haven't got the money to safely provide them, we have had to do things in different ways. And actually what the webcasting has done is has allowed councillors to put that forward uh, and to reason and put their arguments forward in a council chamber and for the public, not just to watch it live, but for us also to be able to clip up the video and to put it onto the Facebook pages that we know our residents are on. So again, it's about us taking what we're doing and putting it where people are. And so we know that they look at the local Facebook pages. I'll put my video on there so they can see me making the case for why I want more investment or more money or a new service uh, in my constituency. Uh, so that is a good thing. But what we now want to do is to make sure that people can follow it on Facebook Live, uh, people can follow it live on Twitter, uh, we want to be able to ensure people know how their councillors have voted on those big issues by having that interactive voting system as well. So there's lots of, lots of places we can go with this and in Basildon the webcasting is just the start. I think local government has to change the way it delivers services but more importantly it has to change the way it talks to its public. We are the front line in local government. So forget Westminster, forget Brexit, forget everything that's happening up in Whitehall right now. It's councils every single day that are providing services for millions of people in all four corners of the country. And they have to be able to talk to their residents, to be able to deliver services to their residents in a way that actually resonates with their residents. So it's about making the council fit in with people's day-to-day -day lives. And we've got to keep pace with that and technology is changing and over the next 10, 20, 30 years, the danger for local government is that if we don't start moving quickly, what's going to happen is we won't keep pace with that change. So in the end, what we'll start doing is developing apps at a time when apps have had their life and they're moving on to something else. So we've got to keep pace. Uh, we need more skills in councils. We need more people who understand digital to come and work in councils. Quite a lot of the people who work in local government have been in local government for 20, 30, 40 years. There is a set way of working. Uh, if we're going to change that, we need new people, a new generation of officer to come into a council and work with um, new councillors. I'm one of the youngest councillors in the country. I'm only 30 years old, so I want to work with new people who want to deliver services in a different way because I know that my generation absorb services and they, they absorb their interactions with each other and with the NHS and with the council and with the police and all the rest of it in a very different way. And I want Basildon Council to be at the forefront of that. When I think of digital transformation, I tend to think of turning an art into a science. Um, it's about providing people with the, the, the mechanisms to, um, to transform what were previously paper type processes um, and things based on lots of learnt and experienced and developed over time into something that's a bit more functional and repeatable. So for example, um, 20 years ago when I was involved in sorting out uh, project management best practice schemes within a large organisation. We had lots of expensive training courses and we had um, lots of written documentation and books on the shelf that people would follow. And that was leading way of doing it then. But now it's much more about doing that with software. So you've got the, the processes are built into the software and people can just follow through that process and pick up the things they need. And they're guided to the actions they're supposed to take at each particular point in that process. And that's really about, um, that's how I feel about digital transformation. It's taking what was a previously learned paper-based process and turning it electronic. And that offers you know many benefits to organisations in terms of speed of um, turnaround and governance uh, improvements, etc. There is a danger of complacency as far as digital transformation is concerned in the public sector. Um, it's very easy to cherry pick some easy, quick wins. At the moment, there is a massive legacy estate within the public sector, and by legacy, I mean systems that are 25, 30 years old, creaking at the seams but will cost a lot to replace if people adopt traditional approaches. What we're very excited about at Tried is some of the techniques that we've developed that enable people to move away from legacy, quickly achieve digital transformation benefits, but not be bogged down with some of the old challenges of legacy migration. I think what social media does is it allows councils to take far more control of messaging. Uh, I think if a council uses video, it uses technology, it uses social media platforms in an effective way, 
it can have far more cut through with their local residents than the traditional forms of media that we've used uh, for the last few decades. Uh, so I, one of the things that I think is really important is that councils, they have their own identity on social media. I, I think being corporate and trying to be too formal is a real downfall of councils, actually. You know, we, we're in a part of Essex. Everyone talks about, you know, the only way is Essex, TOWIE and all that kind of stuff. We've got our own personality in this part of the world. Uh, Mondeo Man was something that was often labelled at, at people from Essex. We need to be able to, as a council, reflect some of that character. And social media is a very good way for us to be able to do that and really talk to people uh, who, who live here and who want to talk to the council. Uh, so it's about, I think, giving councils control. And actually at a time when uh, we need to be careful with our messaging and we need to, as, as we've alluded to, take risks on digital, actually having control of messaging and not being reliant on a journalist to put the right quote in or an editor to frame a debate in the right way, I think is a powerful tool. But the other way is, is also true. So as, as the leader of the council, I probably receive in the region of about 500 messages a week on social media. Uh, and we, we do Facebook Lives that go out to tens of thousands of people. Uh, and what that does is it allows me to interact with my public in a very different way. I don't get 10,000 people turning up at my surgery, but I do get 10,000 people watching Facebook Live over a week period. Uh, and what they might be able to do is give me ideas. And it has actually happened where I've seen things on social media and I've taken that, come back to the council, and we've changed the service because of what somebody said to me on Twitter or Facebook. So that's a hugely powerful tool as well. I think in our, in our sector, there is a, an interest in, in AI and machine learning and the idea that you might be able to get into the black arts of project management, identify when a project might be failing from the data streams and understand that whole sphere a little bit better. Um, I think that's some time away though uh, and would certainly require a lot more data collection and a lot of a lot of work to try and identify those sorts of trends in a in a way that would work well because every project is different and there isn't that stable base off which AI sort of machine learning things tend to tend to work better. The digital revolution is definitely not just hype. Um, you just have to look around and to see the way that organizations are changing and, and everybody, even the senior managers, have computers on their desktop and uh, they are working in software environments. And, um, you know, it, it, it is the way that people deliver their projects now. Certainly if they want to be successful and deliver um, quickly and efficiently, then, then they have to do it that way. Um, in terms of technological solutions for the future, I don't think it's necessarily immediately a new thing, but I'm thinking more about um, a, a spreading of the current technology. So we do still quite a lot of work overseas, um, and whilst most of the world's pretty good for 4G and these sort of systems will work absolutely fine over 4G to your phone if you want them to, many parts of the world don't have 4G. So Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have a number of customers, that still proves to be a bit of a challenge. Um, so it's the, once that sort of stuff rolls out that little bit further and the satellite internet is here, I think that will, uh, that will help quite a lot. I think from my point of view, I, I, I was almost born at exactly the right time uh, because I, I was going through school uh, at a time when we saw the biggest investment ever in public services. So all of a sudden, uh, schools, there was the new school fund, the building schools for the future fund, uh, that was coming out from the government. Uh, we had university being opened up. We had university technical colleges. We had uh, investment in the health service. We had investment in local councils that was helping to foster communities. Uh, and so I was the beneficiary of that. I was the first man in my family to ever go to university. Uh, and I've, I've ended up being in a position uh, 10 years after leaving education to run a council uh, such as Basildon. So I, my view is what councils should be, what the public sector should be, are vehicles to put as many ladders of opportunities in place for people to climb, regardless of their postcode, regardless of their background. Then it's up to people to decide which ladder they want to climb for themselves. But at the moment, the public sector, because of funding pressures, because of the age of austerity, we have removed too many barriers for too many people. And in a borough like Basildon, what we've seen is that in the south of our borough, predominantly we've seen the ladders being removed in the poorest areas. So the gap in this borough has got wider. 
Uh, and if you look in the Basildon Borough, we are the fifth most economically unequal borough in the whole of the UK. So we have to narrow the gap. So if I had one vision, it would be that the public sector, us as a council, the police, the health service, the education service, we can come together in a more integrated way to put more ladders of opportunity in place for people in Basildon so that we narrow that inequality gap. I think it's essential that there are quantifiable goals in place for a digital transformation initiative. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is that when we're building solutions that support digital transformation, we have to be very careful about only doing what's necessary to underpin that transformation. And if we don't have those goals fixed with the customer, we can't challenge ourselves and the customer to say, is this valid, is this relevant work? For many organisations, their project management resource is quite limited. Um, the, the cadre of project managers they have that, are, that they often believe in and trust is quite small. Um, and so enabling them to get through the handle turning, churning, mechanistic parts of project management and letting the, the software do that for them, the, the planning exercises, the resourcing work, the reporting aspects. Previously, people used to say, well, I'd spend, I'd set aside Friday afternoon for writing my reports. And so not having to do that, being able to press a button and get that, means that they can focus their time on the software aspects of project management, the things the machine can't do, um, conflict resolution and things of that type. And so um, that leads to better project management as well, not just quicker and more efficient, but, but better. So clearly there's, there's um, increased pressure on uh, public expenditure and ensuring that what is delivered is, is fit for purpose and value for money. Um, and that's where digital services can really, can really aid that process. Um, uh, certainly GDS are making huge inroads into this, uh, this area by uh, helping to convince departments to not go big bang, but try to deliver more incrementally and ensure that there's value for money at each stage along the way so that what is finally delivered is fit for purpose, value for money. And, um, and meets the needs of those that uh, need to consume the service. There is definitely a digital skills gap across the entire IT landscape, whether that's client organisations or supplier organisations, there is without doubt a gap. Um, we know that, but we've also verified that. Uh, we've surveyed over 100 technology leaders across industry, and everybody is saying there is a gap. From our point of view, we can help client organisations by upskilling their own teams in our model of leading by doing, um, where we come and show people how to deliver digital success and leave that impression on, on the client organisation. But there's also a piece about education in the UK and making sure that there are people coming through with those digital skills. A specific area where there is a skills gap at the moment is, is software developers who are equipped with end-to-end -end engineering skills. So historically, developers have specialised in one area or another. Increasingly, there's an expectation that they can operate across the spectrum of software engineering um, and utilise skills such as DevOps, for example. And those skills are very much in, in demand. So there are possibly more software engineers built that way today than there ever has been before there's still not enough and, and that's where we need to see an increase in the volume of resources. To nearly every organisation digital transformation is everything. Um, we are still occasionally coming across organisations where they still have paper-based processes but the vast majority of organisations are at some degree through the maturity phase of um, transforming those processes. Um, I mean if you're not doing anything you're going to really struggle if you're anything beyond a very small organisation. It tends to be how people um, communicate with their customers, their suppliers, their regulators these days uh, is electronically and if you can do it all on paper and then transfer the last bit at the end then that's really quite a time consuming process. So um, you know if you want to survive you're going to have to transform the way that you did these previously traditional processes. The, the future for data, I think, is big. It's growing all the time. We see customers collecting more and more metrics about more and more topics. Um, and, uh, and that's falling down the maturity tree to smaller and smaller projects increasingly. So people didn't maybe 
bother with financial management on projects below a certain size, and they definitely do now. So, so there's more and more data being collected. People are doing much more with it, KPI calculations and statistical work around all that to try and identify early failing projects, etc. So there's been a big rise in data, but there's also been a big change in the sort of things that people store as part of their projects. So not data per se, but uh, photography and video. Um, we find a lot of people are taking many more photographs as evidence of work that's been undertaken or snagging of things or video tours at the end of buildings etc which is significantly ballooning the, the, the storage that people have as part of their projects. So the sort of things that people are collecting and considering to be documentation has changed substantially as well. You to produce only things that matter as far as the digital transformation is concerned and one of the big traps with software projects is you start to add in functionality that's not genuinely required. Um, so by having those goals established, it gives everybody a framework to reference when we're building software. So absolutely, it's essential. It's clear that digital transformation has altered and improved the way we approach daily life, and it shows no sign of stopping. It may once have been regarded as a slow adopter, but as new digital solutions reach the fore, it would seem that the public sector has found its stride, and there's no going back.